Five years ago, I started an organization called The Blackfish, and it was to address the issue of illegal overfishing. It was when I spent time sailing on the Mediterranean Sea, and I saw more waste floating around in the ocean than wildlife, that I realized protecting the world's oceans is the big issue of our time. Now, tonight, I could start this talk by talking to you about the huge issues we face in our oceans. Species extinction, biodiversity loss, coastal degradation, ocean acidification, industrial pollution, rampant overfishing, modern slavery on board fishing vessels. Yes, the list is huge. But I'm not going to do this. The usual way to talk about environmental issues such as these to an audience like you is to confront you with the frightening urgency of the problems. And it's probably going to make you think, OK, I get it. So what am I supposed to do about it? Instead, let's look at what can be done about it and has been done about it. There has been amazing achievements made by thousands of people, organizations, states, environmental leaders around the world. In recent decades, we've seen a huge push towards sustainability. Wildlife trade is better regulated than ever before, and major global treaties have been passed concerning most of the issues we face today. The most recent example being the Paris Climate Agreement. And many people would say that such agreements don't go far enough. But actually, there is an even bigger issue at stake. There is a big obstacle that is stopping us from truly achieving environmental protection. And it's called enforcement. These guys, they look pretty good, don't they? But the reality is that these two fishing inspectors are the only ones out there protecting an area of sea the size of Texas. There is a serious lack of enforcement of environmental laws. And it's making those laws only worth as much as the piece of paper they are written on. So let's look how traditionally in the environmental sector we have worked to create change. It starts with the analysis. This is where the science and investigative work comes in. It's about identifying problems and understanding what is happening. Now that better understanding in turn leads to awareness. And that awareness turns into protests and lobbying and creating the political momentum we need to push governments to act. Now, when these governments act, they enact new laws or they introduce new policies, which is the real result, right? Well, not quite. It should not be our objective to have good laws or good policies. It should be our objective to have actual protection for nature. And the reason it's not happening is because those laws we write are not properly enforced. Let's see how this applies to our oceans. Scientists have identified a major overfishing crisis. Mankind has a huge appetite for seafood, and the industry has simply become too efficient at catching fish. Estimations now predict a collapse of all major fish stocks within the next few decades. Now, there has been growing awareness for this issue, growing attention. Protests have erupted. World leaders have vowed to take action. In the EU, 200 new fishing laws and regulations have been put forward in the last five years alone, which is awesome. However, the problem is that out there in the field, those fishing inspectors and coast guard officers are understaffed and they are under-resourced. They lack the ships and the aircraft and the budgets that they need to properly enforce the law. And it's making those laws only worth as much as the piece of paper they are written on. So how bad, how, how bad, you know, how bad are these things really? You know, how much of the fish we find on our supermarket shelves do you think could be illegal? Could it be 10%? How about 20 or 30%? Anyone 30, 40%? Estimations now predict that up to half of all the fish 
traded through Europe has illegal origins. That means that every other fish can be traced back to acts of crime. Now, there is growing political momentum to do something about these issues. However, the process is simply too slow. And in certain areas, corruption is making governments ineffective. Another aspect of the problem is a lack of money. Especially poorer nations are struggling to police their own waters. And even in rich nations, national parks and protected areas are easily established on paper. But protecting them on a daily basis, that poses a real challenge. Now, I think it's time we acknowledge that governments cannot fix these problems alone. They need our help. And we have come up with a serious game plan that just does just that, without the need to spend millions. At the Blackfish, we started looking for the resources that would be necessary to strengthen enforcement of environmental laws. And we found them right here in front of us, readily available. We realize that many people are very willing to contribute to meaningful change. The problem is that there is a huge gap between being just a passive donor or becoming a full-time professional conservationist. Now, on the flip side, there are many people with amazing talents and skills that they can contribute to make a difference, be it as a um, pilot or as a tourist or uh, perhaps as a diver or chef, maybe as a business person or nurse, these people can help us increase monitoring capacity. They can help in the collection of evidence to prosecute wildlife criminals. Now, we find that actually tourists are already out there in those fishing ports where we look to investigate illegal fishing. We find people owning sailing yachts that we can train to identify and uh, report on criminal activity at sea. We've even founded a civilian air service to mobilize private pilots, to donate their flying hours, and to help give us eyes in the sky. All this, all this means we are very close to proving that for only 25% of traditional enforcement budgets, we can increase enforcement levels up to 10 times. How? By repurposing people's holidays, family activities. <laughs> by simply asking people to do what they love to do. By asking them to contribute what they feel that they're good at. And in the process, get them to contribute in a small way to, into a big goal. And remarkably, it is working. Let me give you three concrete examples. First, let's go to the west coast of Sweden. And this is an area where codfish, uh, uh, um, where they reproduce, where they lay their eggs. And for this purpose, there is an area at sea which is entirely closed off to fishing. Now, illegal fishing is suspected to take place in this area. But the Swedish fishing inspectors, they don't have their own aircrafts or ships. They rely on the Coast Guard for this purpose. But in turn, they are often preoccupied with other tasks. So right now, we've started planning with our air service, which is called the Wildlife Air Service. We started planning ahead for patrols to start in this area next January. And we would carry out three-hour patrol flights every night for 10 nights. And we've just worked out that in those 10 nights, we will carry out more fisheries enforcement flights than the Swedish government does in an entire year. Even though they have an estimated quarter of a million budget assigned for this purpose. And our budget, seven and a half thousand. Let's give you another example. Um, let's go to southern Italy, the island of Sicily. Along the north coast, an area where illegal fishing is widespread. Especially the use of so-called drift nets is a major concern. Now, these illegal nets, which can be many miles long, they catch everything in their path. Whales, dolphins, sharks, turtles. The United Nations banned the use of these nets in 1992, but their use continues to this day. Now, in this area, there's a f only a few fishing inspectors that have to cover multiple ports. What we can do is we can come in 
And at the height of the drift net fishing season, we can cover multiple ports at the same time, day and night. Our volunteers, or citizen inspectors as we call them, are trained up, are trained up to go into these ports and to basically monitor, to identify, to document and to report the illegal fishing. Because our inspectors crowdfund for their own involvement, 70% of all the costs to realize this type of monitoring is raised by the participants themselves. Now let me give you another example of how we can do a lot with limited funds. We've been preparing to start patrolling at sea in the most problematic areas, especially around the Mediterranean Sea. Um, once we have a ship, we can start tracking illegal fishing from land, air and sea. Now, traditionally, we would go to funders and we would ask them for the hundreds of thousands of euros we would need to purchase a ship. But instead, we found Mirko, a Dutch shipbuilder. Um, Mirko donated the use of his skills and with donated materials, he is now building a steel expedition vessel for us. And it's a sailing vessel, which means it is remarkably cheap to operate. Now, regardless of how cheap it is to operate a vessel like this, it would cost in excess of 2 million euros to build this ship. However, we believe we found a way that by the end of this year, we are able to build this ship and get it operationally next year for an estimated 50,000 euros. How? Because we approach businesses and maritime training colleges and volunteers and we ask them to contribute in kind, products, time, expertise. When people with common passions come together, a lot is possible. But when people with common passions, but perhaps with different disciplines come together, nothing is impossible. So how do we find each other? Last year, I visited an airfield in, in the UK, and um, there was a guy there, his name is Bob. Uh, Bob is in his 50s, he recently went into early retirement, and he just loves to fly. I mean, this guy is crazy about airplanes. So I meet Bob and, and I ask him, um, you know, and I start talking to him and I tell him about the oceans and about how our tuna species are dying out and that we have to take action. And you know what? He didn't care. He doesn't care. He loves aviation. He doesn't care about conservation. Anyway, so the next day I'm back at the airfield and I see Bob again and I walk over to him and I ask him about his aircraft. His, you know, and, and suddenly his eyes lit up and he starts talking passionately about his Cessna aircraft and the recent flying he's been doing. And right there and then I realized that we have been approaching this the wrong way all along. Bob doesn't care about the environment. He doesn't care about overfishing. Bob cares about flying. And if we ask Bob what lies close to his heart and we ask him to contribute what he loves to do for a good cause, then he's excited and he's ready to jump into action. And that fact, that very simple fact that by appealing to people at their level and asking them to contribute what they love to do and what they're good at, that is what will make conservation a far bigger and more powerful force than it is today. Similarly, we met a couple last year, Libby and Andy, both uh, professionals in executive jobs, busy lives, careers, but also keen to do more than just donate money. So we gave them an opportunity to train with us, to be trained up as citizen inspectors. And during their holiday time, two weeks a year, they join us in our undercover investigations. And increasingly, the photographs they take in those fishing ports serve as criminal evidence necessary to prosecute those breaking the law. Now we have close to 100 of such citizen inspectors trained at the moment, and we hope to bring this up to 150 people by the end of this year thereby making us the largest civilian fisheries monitoring network in the world. Now, let me make one thing very clear here. In terms of envir protect environmental protection in general, we are not winning. In fact, all, if we can't, unless we can get proper implementation of all those hard-fought laws, the legacy of all those who have made sacrifices for the conservation of nature before us, will be lost. Now, the cliche way to finish a talk like this would be to say, now it's all up to you. 
you know, you can uh, become a full-time eco-warrior or uh, make a donation. Just to be clear, we're not opposed to receiving donations, <laughs> but it's not our <laughs> primary goal. But actually, for a moment, let's forget about the money. Conservation, like many other issues, it's all about people. You don't have to give up your life to fight global problems. What makes a true difference is that you apply your, your skills, is that you make available your time that you have available to do what you love or what you feel that you're good at. And if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to take that simple yet very, very meaningful step, then us at the Blackfish welcome you and we commit to helping you turn your personal contribution into having an amazing impact. Thank you.